Good afternoon, good afternoon everybody. The earpiece has just fallen out. Everything's a disaster. I can't identify that bird. I think it is a dark chanting goshawk. That is what I'm going with. It is a beautiful, beautiful afternoon here in the northeast corner of South Africa. We are in the western fringes of the Kruger National Park, iconic national park of the world, part of the Greater Limpopo Transfrontier Park, which is eight million acres of African wilderness wonderland. Now you happen to be on a live safari that means that we are broadcast live and unedited, uh, which is probably how I get away with saying what I do half the time. My name is James Hendry. On camera today is Brian the Thumb Joubert. Very nice. Thank you, Brian. On the other vehicle is Scott. He's being filmed by the diminutive but highly skilled Viam Durenbrach. And in the final control on the vocals is Kirsten. And on the keys, I believe, is Leanne. Now, let us look at that bird again, and I'll tell you why I've identified it the way I have. There are only two birds that could possibly be. One is the dark chanting goshawk, the other is the gabar goshawk. Both have got slightly orangish pinkish legs and an orangish pinkish sear. The sear is the kind of, um, well, it's that sort of colorful bit that goes over the nostrils, really. That is what the sear is. And the other thing to look for is the barring on the chest, uh, not the chest, on the belly. Now, the only real difference between these two birds, color-wise or um, morphologically, if you like, is the size. A gabar goshawk is 30 centimeters long, which is about a foot, and a dark chanting goshawk is 50 centimeters long, so it's almost twice the size. You'd think that'd be easy to identify. I always think they're going to be until I look at them and then I find myself confused, and I'm I'm doubting myself even as I say this, because as the sun comes out and shines onto that bird, his legs look a lot more orangey than they do pink, which would indicate that he is a gabar goshawk. Oh, gosh, Brian, how tall do you think he is? you think he's 30 centimeters or 50 centimeters? I'm going with the 50. I'm going with 50 as well. Let's, shall we move on before we can... Uh, well, you know, the other thing we can look at, everyone, is his eyes. His eyes look pretty red, unlike the... Well, yeah, let's just go with the gabar for now. I'm going to stick a little bit of time with him. Um, please do ask us questions throughout the course of the drive. Hashtag Safari Live, questions at wildearth.tv. And while you're thinking about what to say to me about this bird, let's head across to Scott Dyson. He is with some primates. Hello, everyone. And I'm glad you got a glimpse of that vervet monkey just after it quenched its thirst here at the Juma waterhole. We thought we'd stop off here for the start of the safari because I know a lot of you will be missing the view of the Juma waterhole camera, which is situated in a tree just to our right. So we are simulating the kind of regular view that you would have if this camera was working. But don't worry, our tech team is on it. They're doing everything in their power to try and resolve the problems there. And I'm hoping that in the next couple of days, it will be back up. Now, as you can see, the two resident hippos that have been spending time here are still here. There's one buffalo, not as many as are kind of usually here, but I'm sure they'll come and go as the afternoon unfolds. A couple of ox peckers jumping around that buffalo's back. There were some yellow-billed oxpeckers in the area earlier, which are rare to see relative to the red-billed oxpeckers, which we can see here. So we'll keep an eye out for them. I think they may have moved off, though. They are very clearly distinguishable from these. Oh, the hippo is reshuffling, repositioning, hence the small waves being created there. I'm sure a lot of you are happy to start off the safari with James's dark chanting goshawk. That's not a bird we get to see very often, so well done to him for locating that. 
Now the plans for this vehicle for this afternoon are to head off towards the last position of the five in Kuhuma Lioness, which are probably only about five minutes away from us. They were left right on our northern boundary, so there is a chance they may have moved across into an area where we cannot see them. They are also in a very low signal area, so I'm hoping that we are going to be able to get some views of them, together with having signal if they are still here on Juma. One thing I forgot to mention is that my name is Scott, for those of you who may be joining for the first time. And I'm teamed up with VM, a.k.a. the Wildebeest, on camera. Hello, Mark. And I'm just going to reverse quickly for you, because you would like to know if these hippos are not fighting for territories because they are juveniles. And there's nothing juvenile about them that I can see. They are both big hippos and I think it's merely the fact that it's a drought and that times are desperate that they are tolerating one another they probably have realized that there's nothing really worth fighting for other than their lives at the moment no ladies and I think because they are in this kind of desperate times they are just dealing with one another the intricacies to why exactly they are accepting one another's presence, I cannot answer, but I can assure you that they are definitely not juveniles. Let's take a quick look at the greater blue-eared starling here. It's glistening beautifully. Look at that in the afternoon sunlight. And isn't it fascinating how many animals are relying on this little source of water? Oh, a virtual starling just flew in and chased them off. You big bully. Not even that it wants to have a drink there. Um, it landed just up on the right there in the bush. Yeah, well done. It's a slightly bigger starling. You can also see it iridescing in the sunshine. And let's do one more bird while we're here. It's one that you don't get to see very easily, very often. They're quite skittish. It's just walking along the opposite side of the dam there, VM. There we go. And emerald, oh, look at its uh, emerald windows glistening when the sun connects at the right angle. That was awesome, and it's something, I guess, that we don't get to see very often, that emerald sheen from the emerald spotted wood doves. Look at that. Like little jewels on its wings. It's a tiny dove, this one. About half the size of the regular ones. But one of my favorites, this and the Namaqua dove, are small, but very pretty. Now, this is fascinating. I think it's scared of drinking, and you saw those little ripples there in front of it. Try and keep on. The water, there we go. Now, a terrapin could quite easily snatch a small bird like this out of the water, pull it under, and devour it. Oh, and that's why it is so nervous being there. You may have seen a small ripple, and I'm wondering if that wasn't a little terrapin trying to latch onto it. Good point. That's just been brought up from Joyce in Pennsylvania. Um, and I know, Matt, you said that uh, we're asking why these two aren't fighting. There is a chance that one could be a female. Um, the one, uh, let's look at the one on the left first. It's not going to be easy to show you because they're not lying at the perfect angles. But the head of the one on the left is longer and bigger than the individual's head on the right. And that indicates to me that the one on the left could well be a male and that the one on the right could well be a female. Oh, hello, boy. You heard us talking about you, and you're acknowledging that, yes, you are the big daddy. And that this is your girlfriend. Fair enough. Fair enough. Apologies. We were not instigating that the other one was your boyfriend. We were merely unsure whether it was a boy or a girl. But thank you for helping to confirm, yes, that it is, in fact, a lady, and she's very pretty. We just can't see enough of her face, although she's rolling over VM. Let's see if we can't get this. Whoa. Ah! Much more ladylike. And now I can really see that she has got a considerably smaller head than his. So thank you, Joyce in Pennsylvania. The joy of being on a live safari with thousands of people is that if you do make mistakes, you get quickly corrected. Or even if you don't make a mistake, you merely do not make an observation as good as those around you. You can get very quickly corrected. So thank you for that. All right, 
Right, it is a beautiful afternoon. Um, oh, well spotted, VM. We can't get away from this waterhole. The action's all unfolding here. There's some baby oxpeckers having a bath. The babies don't have the bright red beak and yellow eye just yet. It's developing slowly, but it's not as prominent. There we go. There's an even younger one. Oh, settle down. And they're enjoying what is quite a muddy bath, but I guess it must be so cooling and refreshing. Here come more. We're in for a treat. Look at the one sweating there, holding its beak wide open. By sweating, I mean panting, keeping cool. Pool party! <laughs> Um, an absolute hive of activity. Ah, now, Donna in South Carolina, you ask a very good question and you'd like to know where are all the weaver birds that we usually see? And because there's not much water around, Donna, I guess they've moved elsewhere. Uh, the, the village weavers that we, we saw last summer at Treehouse Waterhole were, um, they, they need to nest above water. It's one of their prerequisites for their, their accommodation and their nesting. They always nest above water. So when there's no water to nest above, they don't nest here. Interestingly, the village weaver is the one on the bottom right. Okay, so these are the ones that we saw um, here last year. And let me just double check that I wasn't talking uh, rubbish. It says, coarsely woven nests, usually suspended from a tree or in reeds, often over water. I guess, okay, so it's not always over water, but they prefer to have it over water. Interestingly, just before you came to us, I saw a southern masked weaver come and join us at the water hole here. So I did see one of these um, just a few minutes before. They're very difficult to tell apart. Basically, you can see how the black crown extends upwards from the beak onto the forehead, whereas the village weaver, the black crown kind of ends at the base of the beak. It doesn't extend up onto the forehead. Otherwise, other than that, they look just about the same to me. But I did see a southern mast weaver. So the weavers are around. We're just not entirely sure where their nests are at the moment. There's one last bird I want to. Oh, hello. Getting comfy. They sure can cast a very evil death stare when they want to, the Cape Buffalo. They make me feel like I'm a naughty schoolboy. Good, so we're going to leave him to it and continue on. The bird you can hear calling is a virtual starling. It's quite a robotic call. Um, and it was directly above us. There it goes again. Beautiful clouds in the sky. Oh, VM quickly on the left here. We so close. Oh, no. <laughs> we were so close to those yellow bulled ox peckers. They just popped out from the other side of this buffalo. But we are going to go back to show them to you. They are so different. Are we ever going to get away from this water hole? I'm not sure. Huh. The oxpeckers are hiding on the other side of the buffalo. Maybe they are a little bit camera shy. They're still on it. Sorry? Feed them a little bit. Okay. Oh, now they've come up. They're dodging us. But we will get you, yellow bulled ox peckers. <laughs> Maybe not. Mm. Bear with me, everyone. I am not going to give up until we get you a view of the ox pecker. Ah, oh, there you hiding in the shade, you sneaky things. As I would be. Uh oh, no, the buffalo is not too impressed with our behavior. But there they are. Look at that. What an awesome shot. And well done, Viem. Finally, you can see the yellow billed oxpecker also does have red on its bill, so its name can be a little bit misleading. I'm just going to roll.
fall forward ever so slightly. They are very clever, these birds. They're choosing the shaded side of the buffalo. There we go. Just parking off in the shade, and that's why we couldn't see them earlier on the other buffalo. They were just clinging on with their zygodactyl foot structure, two toes forward, two toes backwards. Unlike a lot of birds who have got three toes forward and one toe back. And aren't they incredibly talented when it comes to clambering around? Oh. Sorry, Mr. Buffalo. He didn't like the sound of us creaking forward then. The vintage jigger. All right, well, we are going to venture forth and go and check out what these lions are up to. And while we do that, we're going to send you back over to Mr. Henry to see how his safari is coming along. Now, you'll find us here in the far reaches of Aratuza. Aratuza, of course, the Paddy word or northern Sutu word for help, and uh, Vero Zebra, let us view them. He looks like a particularly impressive zebra, that one. So impressive that he isn't even a he, he's a she. Don't run, don't run, don't run. There we go. Look at the beautiful little foal. Probably about two months old, maybe even less. He's a very tiny little fellow. His mum looks in pretty good nick. And that's what she thinks of us. Wonderful. It's nice to see that her kidneys are still working, don't you think, Brian? Mm, splendid. It is splendid. It is always good to see that an animal's kidneys are in good function. I'm not sure what else to say about that, um, other than the fact that that is obviously a female, that is its youngster, and they have been, <laughs> despite the drought, the zebras still seem to be in pretty good condition. If you look at the female's neck there, the mare's neck, her mane is standing up on end, it's not lying down, which means the fat reserves in her neck are still fine. She hasn't used them all up yet, and therefore she's fine. Now, the little one is trying to suckle, Gee was that's amazing. I've always thought with horses, in fact, with most of the animals out here, the angles at which the youngsters have to twist their heads in order to have a meal is quite astonishing. Isn't that sweet? And then as the little one suckles, of course, it's also a lot more gentle than many of the animals out here. S lots of them, especially things like the impala and the nyala, they get hold of the mother's teat and they absolutely tear at it. And it looks to be the most incredibly painful thing in the world. Luckily, the zebra foal is very much more gentle than most of the other young herbivores. Just a little bit younger than the one we saw killed two nights ago by the Nkuhuma pride. And some very clever viewer, I forget exactly who it was, posted the fact she actually did a striped comparison of the injured zebra foal that was seen firstly at the... Was seen... Sorry, I've just heard a bird shouting. It was a lilac-breasted roller. Um, firstly, this hapless zebra foal was seen with a broken leg at the Juma Dam Pan, and then again, uh, not the same day, on game drive. And we think pretty much sure, actually, having seen those screenshots of the stripe pattern that it was that little one that was killed by the lions. So, weakness immediately picked up by those lions. Like I say, a very beautiful afternoon. The clouds have, uh, well, they've split apart a bit, allowing a little bit of sunlight through, which I think is wonderful. It's not too hot. It's about 34 degrees or 35 degrees Celsius, 93 degrees Fahrenheit, which is actually very pleasant for this time of year. And I think that we have broken the back of the really nasty heat 
going into March, we'll start to get slightly more autumnal temperatures. It certainly won't be cold, but there'll be a little bit more autumnal. Now, the rest of the kinship group to which that mare and the foal belong is over here. And we call a zebra's social structure a kinship group. There's the stallion, his wives, and their youngster. And what I've always found amazing is that when a young stallion wishes to claim some wives for himself, what he does is he challenges an older stallion. And if he beats him up, um, his wives will, or the older stallion's wives will remain faithful, but his daughters will then normally go off with the challenger. But his old wives uh, will remain with the old boy without pretty much for life, but I suppose if he gets totally decrepit, they might move on. That's quite an, I've always quite liked that story. Look at those stripes. Look at the stripes as the little foal moves. <laughs> you can actually see the little bump there underneath the, the stomach, and that's from the umbilical cord. Very sweet. And very autumnal colors already in this particular area. The green is not very green. You can see it all turning slightly yellow, and a lot of the trees are actually even losing their leaves now, which is much too early. Normally, that would only happen in the autumn and the winter, of course. And this is my favorite zebra species. We get four different species around the place. This is my favorite one because it looks most like a horse, I suppose. The rest tend to look like donkeys. And, um, well, donkeys, much maligned in history, of course, are not my, um, not my idea of the most attractive animal in the world. Yours, Brian? Mm, not really. And donkey is the, uh, yes, it's, 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 a, it's a poor equid, really. Let's sneak a little bit forward. Beautiful that you saw a yellow-billed oxpecker at the pan. Not many of them around, of course. Now, we are on the very far western fringes of Arethusa, like I say, and our plan is to just try and basically see what we can find here. I've got no updates from what happened here this morning, so we'll just be on a little voyage of discovery, and as we com often say, Anything can happen around any corner. Uh, quite a lot of the time, nothing happens around every corner, but that's okay. It's still a very beautiful place to be. And I must say, even despite the fact that there is this drought and the grass is sparse and the leaves are wilting, you can find beauty just about everywhere you look here, if you know what to look for. Let's just sneak slowly forward. I did see that lilac-breasted roller hunting around here. We'll just sneak forward if we can see that magnificent little lilac-breasted roller. Ah, now Steph, you want to know about the four species of zebra. Uh, you've got three of them right. You said the plain zebra, which is what this one is. The uh, one is the Hartman's Mountain zebra, which you got, which was found in Namibia largely. And then you get the Cape Mountain zebra, which is unsurprisingly found in the Cape here. And the other one is an interesting fellow called a Grivy's zebra. And it's the only zebra that doesn't live in these kinship groups. It's uh, got very closely um, spaced striping. And it also looks a bit like a donkey rather than a horse. And it lives up in East Africa. And it has a totally different social structure, where it's a bit like an impala, really, where they get little bachelor groups, and then you get a you get a dominant territorial stallion. These stallions are not territorial at all. They've just got home ranges. He's got a dominant territorial stallion and a sort of harem of females, and he can be challenged at any stage, and the young males go off and live in bachelor herds. So this is a slightly different sort of structure to the one that they have here. But the gravy zebra I've never seen. I know it's Scott's favorite zebra. You see him up in East Africa, but not over here. We only get the plain zebra or virtual zebra out here in southern Africa, at least in eastern Africa. 
eastern southern Africa in the Kruger National Park. I'm getting horribly tongue-tied, Brian. Must be the heat. You see, I attempted to wash my hat today, Brian. Oh, did you? Yes. Oh. You didn't what? notice, did you? No, it looks the same. Hmm. I'm starting to feel that I may well have to buy a new one. Now, David, on YouTube, I'm not sure I understand your question, but I'm going to try very hard to answer it. You want to know how tall is the back of a zebra, not how tall it is. Um, I'm not really sure how to answer that, except to say that at the shoulder, so if you measure a zebra at the shoulder, it, it'll stand about, well, if we do it in horse language, about 14.2, and about 14.2 is probably about 1.6 meters, or five foot five at the shoulder, and then sloping down to the back, probably about half a foot shorter than that, so about five foot, I guess, a really big zebra. Does that answer your question, David? If it doesn't, please feel free to send through another one. I'll tell you what you could do. You could draw a sort of sketch of a zebra, if you like, take a picture of it, tweet it through, and uh, tell us which dimension you want to know. Might work. Like I say, heading down the eastern, at least the western fringes of Arethusa, and we're often asked about fire. And people often talk about fire, and they fear that a runaway fire might come through the area, especially as we're having a drought at the moment. And if you look at this area here to the left of us, Brian, you can see that the tops of the trees I'm just going to check that I'm still on the property here. But the tops of the trees have got no leaves on them. Now, that is particularly important. I'm just going to have to reverse slightly. I'm trespassing. I should have taken the other road. We're now on Elephant Plains, everybody. I hope you're enjoying your game drive on Elephant Plains. Did you notice the difference, Brian? I did. <laughs> so, that's Elephant Plains. We're in it right now. We shouldn't be. We need to get out of here. I'm just going to turn that round, turn that down. Phew, Brian, that was close, wasn't it? That was fantastic. Isn't it? As you do, your heart rate exhilarating. racing, absolutely exhilarating to perform a crime and then get away with it. Whew. Okay, back to the fire story. If we look at the trees over here, you can see the tops of them have got no leaves on them. Now, that's because it was burned, but only two years ago. At the bottom of the trees, they're all growing just fine. And that's called coppicing. And coppicing is what happens when a tree is killed on the top layer, the rootstock survives, and then it grows up from that bottom layer. And we're often asked about fire, like I say, and especially at a time like this in the drought, and people often want to know, well, what happens if a fire comes through here? A fire really could not come through here. At this stage, there's no grass, and so nothing would burn. These trees wouldn't burn at all. They might be killed by a very severe fire underneath the ground, and not underneath the ground, in the grass. But they wouldn't actually be enough to sustain a big burn. So, no risk of fire in the area now. Pulling myself out here, Brian. It's a disaster. Right, I'm back in. Now, what we're going to do is head to a little pan over here. And we'll see what we can find at the water there. Scott, on the other hand, is with some heartbeats, or be they very slow and relaxed. And we'll cross over to him, and I'll see you at the water there. Well, we are in luck. And the Inkahuma Pride are still on Juma, only just. They are probably about 15 meters south of our southern boundary, sorry, our northern boundary, which for those of you who are new to Safari Live is merely a road, and it keeps people where they need to be. What gave you guys a fright? Was that just the wind? Incredible to see how fast their reactions were. And the wind is gusting. Fascinating. Here it really comes. You may even be able to hear it. 
Sorry, ladies. They've got a huge fright. They're now holding their noses up into the wind. Wouldn't it be wonderful to know what they can smell with their powerful senses? As I was saying, the animals have freedom of moving wherever they like, and if they do decide to head north from this position, we sadly won't be able to view them. But as you can see, it doesn't look like they are going anywhere for the time being, and I'm guessing that they're not going to get active for at least another hour and a half or two hours, and it may be that they're still in the same place by the end of the sunset safari. We were hugely fortunate this morning. We got to see them. We found them probably five minutes into the safari, if that, and then followed them basically on the move up until right at the end of the safari. We saw them playing with one another, climbing trees, chasing buffalo, buffalo chasing them. And it was another magical morning spent with them. But I think for now, as you can all see, we're gonna probably be able to go and invest our efforts elsewhere and see what else we can find. Dave Dungan, you're right, it has been an incredibly productive few days regarding quality sightings of lions. And I've kept telling everyone, as long as we keep spending a lot of time with these animals, investing time with them, we are going to build up credits and eventually get lucky and get spoiled with some good quality sightings. So, I know it's, it's often uh, myself who says, you need to be patient, and then 10 minutes later, we're leaving the sighting. Um, but where possible, it, it, it is really worth uh, spending time with these animals. But for now, I haven't seen any other prey in, in the area. And even though some prey could stumble upon them and we could miss out on some action, I feel that it's going to be worth driving around. There's obviously a lot of other animals out here that we can see and enjoy, especially while the lions are asleep. But let's just take another quick look at them. You can see they're breathing quite quickly. That'll be due to the heat. And they're trying to obviously pant to keep cool. They're quite fast hot, uh, sorry, breathing rate. But they're not incredibly full bellied of anything they you could say medium. They fed on a zebra foal, not yesterday evening, the evening before. So they're by no means starving, they, you could say content, but this evening I think they are going to be motivated to try and fill those bellies up again. So let's hope that they head deeper into Juma when we can at least get to see what they get up to. Ah, Mike in Florida, you would like us to carry on. I was waiting for somebody to give me permission. Thank you very much. You can see I didn't waste any time there. Woohoo! let's go. And you would like us to go and find the kingfishers. Now, for those of you who don't know Mike in Florida, he is at the moment leading the ornithological challenge and has got the most birds on his bird list. I think it's 230 something. And as we continue trying to find you a new bird for your list, Mike, we're going to send you over to James, who's got one of the regular customers regarding the avian species. Enjoy. It is very, very seldom that we get a spectacular view like this of a grey go-away bird. And it is normally a frugivorous bird, which means it likes to eat fruit. But today, it is eating the new shoots of... Well, it's a tree called Gymnosporia senegalensis, which is very rich in tannins. And, uh, I mean, certainly to the human palate, very bitter and not very nice at all. But to the grey go away bird in times of drought, it's clearly something that's quite useful to eat. Only taking the little, the sort of smallest, smallest leaves, and maybe they've got slightly less tannin than the others. But I mean, it is so tannin rich in many respects that it can actually numb your mouth. It always amazes me how they manage to maneuver themselves around in the trees like that without getting their wings stuck. And the technical facility and strength that it takes for them to hop 
from one branch to another like that is absolutely incredible. If you think about that, if you think about, <laughs> that's, him, that's why it's called a go away bird. If you think about jumping your own body height onto a block or onto a wall and then balancing there, it would be totally impossible. And we watch birds hopping around and we think, oh, well, that's not that impressive. And it is actually astonishing. Now, this grey go-away bird is uh, not alone here. You see, Brian? Not at all. Not at all, Brian. He has two friendies. Two very large friendies. There we go. That is, of course, the infamous Cape buffalo or African buffalo. Infamous because they are renowned, apparently, for being the most dangerous of animals to meet on foot. This, of course, is unsurprising, as the legend comes from those who like to hunt them. And if you try and hunt a buffalo, then it becomes very cross with you indeed, and why shouldn't it? If you are not, however, harassing it, you can normally view them relatively safely on foot. Although, that said, we did have an experience the other day, Steph and Brian and I, where we were watching some buffalo at quite a distance. We'd often walked past them. I think probably those buffalo you saw earlier at the Juma Dam Pan. And they kind of gathered in a phalanx and they started heading towards us from about 60 meters out, which was quite a big distance. Anyway, we disappeared quite quickly and they left us alone in the end. And we seem to be catching animals really at this sort of wrong time, all of them going doing We've got a chevrolet. It's coming um, under this tree in the grass. There, it's just reared up. We've got a black mamba, everyone. There it goes. Look at how quick it is. This is incredible. It's about two meters in length. Not the biggest we've seen, but look at how quick it is. Absolutely awesome, and it slithered down a hole. We got it just in time, and a oh big God. thank you. Oh no, it hasn't. There, it keeps going. Look at how fast it is. I thought it had gone down a hole. Oh, oh no. Immediate. There it is. Where'd it go? <laughs> Let's race after it. Ah, I can't start the car fast enough. I think it's just disappearing off now into a thicket. How quickly did it cover that ground? Whew, it's gone. And that was a rush. Kirsty, thank you for bringing everyone back onto our vehicle so quickly. And sorry to rush you guys into the mayhem there, but how awesome was that? We've got a big thank you to a few little birds, uh, rattling cysticulars and a few scrub robins that were uh, alarm calling. Sweet, 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 sweet. Uh, and we thought, should we go back? Shouldn't we go back? Should we go and see what's going on? And it paid off thanks to Viam, who spotted the black mamba. And that is probably our third, fourth, fifth sighting of one of the most deadly snakes in southern Africa at the moment. You do not want to be bitten by one of those. They've got a neurotoxic venom that basically shuts down the nervous system. Um, the good news is if somebody can breathe for you, you can stay alive for many hours. Um, so that's an important thing to remember. If you are bitten by a black mamba, don't panic. Just tell people that you need just some breathing apparatus, even if you lose the ability to breathe for yourself. As long as somebody just keeps getting oxygen going into your body and you can take your time to get to hospital and then get the necessary treatments. Anyway, thank you for coming back. We are going to continue racing over towards Sydney's waterhole where Brent has found some hippo who appeared to be having an altercation. So we'll call you when we get there. But for now, back to James. Well, what a very appropriate time for you to have gone across to see that spectacular snake. This buffalo has just gone to the loo. Um, I think he's finished now, and so we can continue talking about him. He is, of course, he and his companion covered in mud. They've been lying in this black sort of oozing mud for the whole day, cooling down and enjoying the protection that the mud offers them from parasites and the like. You can see he's, ugh, they always look slightly depressed, I find. He's just shaking an oxpecker off his head. The oxpecker's looking a bit offended on the floor, standing at the ground. The buffalo's staring it down. Not even sure if you can see it. You, can you see it there, Brian? Yeah. 
It's actually quite amusing from my angle. Another ox pick is there. Let's just sneak a little bit forward. Now, James, Richard, you say that I tend to be a bit of a rebel when I'm in Arethusa, that I, I don't do borders. James, Richard, yes, that's true, but it's unintentional. I'm obviously just lacking in a certain fine-tuning of my directional sense out here. It was just a very small wrong turn that I took twice, both times I've been down here. The other day, I ended up at a waterhole that I'd never seen before. I shan't tell you which property I was on, but it wasn't either Arethusa or Juma. Very embarrassing. And here is a rubbing post. Let me just... What I would like to do is just see if there isn't something stuck in it in the way of an ectoparasite. I don't really want to get out here, though. Now, what these rubbing posts often have in them is ticks embedded in the mud. So the ticks get onto the buffalo, the buffalo roll in the mud, the mud dries, and you've seen how clay contracts when it gets dry. It makes those, it sort of, the, when the water leaves it, it contracts and it sucks the ticks off the skin, and they then rub the mud off onto these rubbing posts. And there are often ticks stuck in the mud there. I can't see any of that at the moment, though. Okay. Brian, I think that this water hole has given us all that it's going to today. Let us continue. I've yet to see a black mumba here, which is a bit of a pity, because they are tremendously impressive snakes. Scott has seen two, at least, while he's been live. But I don't think I've seen a snake live at all. Jamie's seen three. Jamie doesn't count, though, because she sees everything. Now, Tony, you're in London, and you would like... Brent and I certainly are an enormous wild dog fan, and you say, where are the dogs? We haven't seen them for several days. The last we heard, they were in the far west, as far as I can tell. We don't know which pack that was. It's not unusual not to see them for several days. It's not unusual not to see them for up to a month at a time, sometimes two months. They roam so widely, and so they will be wherever the prey is most abundant. And I wonder if they haven't headed further off to the east, into the Kruger, where, of course, things are really a bit tougher than they are here. Very little artificial water, which means that a lot of the herbivores there are going to be struggling, and it's probably very easy pickings for a pack of wild dogs in that area at the moment. So that's where I think the dogs are. They're certainly not right around where we are now, are they, Brian? No, they are not. There's an impala, Brian. So stop and view him. Except he is hiding now behind a bushel. Let's go forward. <laughs> Sometimes it's just not your day. We found the only solitary impala at Arethusa, everybody. The only solitary and, well, pathologically shy impala at Arethusa. <laughs> CJ, do you want to know if I have a, 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 a favorite venomous snake? Um, I'm not sure that I do have a favorite venomous snake, CJ. I, snakes are... Snakes and I have a relationship that couldn't be described as the closest. Uh, I'm not an enormous lover of snakes. I can appreciate their amazing beauty and their amazing uh, biology, uh, but I'm no snake wrangler. So, in terms of venomous snakes, no, I don't think I have a particular favorite. Maybe a boom slung or a tree snake. Very beautiful they are, beautiful colors. 
and uh, tremendously skilled, and they're quite shy too, of course, which means they're unlikely to stick their fangs into you, which is always an advantage. The most common venomous snake we get here, um, I would suspect would be one of two things, one of either the puff adder or the Mozambican spitting cobra, one of three. Spitting cobra, snouted cobra, or a puff adder. I suspect you will find that a puff adder is probably the most common. Yes, now I'm really pleased about this. I told you. There, Scott is at Sydney's dam and he's going to confirm what so many of you doubted me for. Have a look. Now, I sadly cannot take responsibility for confirming just yet that there are in fact crocodiles here. If VM zooms out a little bit, he'll be able to show you Brent and Aubrey um, parked on the water's edge there. Their much closer vantage point is allowing them a view of these crocodiles, which I'm told are quite small and close to the dam wall which is on the opposite side to us. Sadly though, it's just too far for us to see. Um, but well done, James. I am very impressed that with the oldest binoculars on the planet, he managed to decipher that there was in fact crocodiles in here. Now, the two hippos who are busy having a debate are the one that you can see on the left out of the kind of water, ankle deep, and the one to its right. Now what usually happens, not dissimilar to human boxing matches, is that you have breathers in between rounds. We don't know how many rounds they've been at it for now, but they're just taking a break. That will change, I guess, at some points. I've watched a handful of hippo fights in my life, and like I said, they increase hugely in intensity for a couple of minutes and then subside, let one another catch their breath and then they go at it again. They can be hugely violent. They've got massive, massive teeth that can lacerate their opponent's hide and flesh, and there's often a lot of blood to be seen. The mouths also often bleed quite heavily because they tear one another's palates and mouth parts open with one another's teeth. They kind of basically can open their mouths about 180 degrees and there's a lot of head-on conflict. I'm not sure how long it's gonna take. Brent did say though, before we got you, that they were really going at it. So I think it's gonna be worth hanging around here because the last time I got to see a hippo fight was probably this time last year when two hippo bulls were fighting at the Juma waterhole, not the tiny little pond where we started off the afternoon safari, but a much ra larger body of water that is currently bone dry, sadly, due to the drought. I know you've been discussing that with James. Now, you may be wondering again why we are not parked near the water's edge. It's not because I'm scared of hippopotamus, but you do need to respect them. They are one of, ooh, is there some action unfolding here, maybe? Are we in luck? What is going to happen? This may be, ding, 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 round three. Here we go. Listen to that. You can probably even hear them calling from here. Look at them wagging their tails, not in excitement, but to spray their own feces. It's a territorial and dominance display fanning their poop far and wide, as well as opening their mouths very wide and displaying their teeth. I'm sure they're gonna make contact shortly. You can maybe hear a few low bellowing grunts coming from these two. Hmm, oh my God, certainly thoughts about it, but again, 
They may have been fighting all day, and this fight may take a long time to deduce who in fact is the winner. And we're probably going to find hippos and a lot of the animals becoming a lot more aggressive with one another as the drought continues, especially with the animals that rely so heavily on water. Surely something's got to give here. They're just getting too close. And one of them, I'm sure, will lurch forward at some point. As I was saying, though, they are north of our northern boundary, so we're kind of spying on them from the border. And that is why I can't take you any closer. Apologies for that. The grey go away bird's calling nearby. Hello, Lynn. You've mentioned that you are surprised by the fact that there are not actually more hippo fights than what we are seeing due to the lack of water. And it, it is very true. Um, I guess a contributing factor to that is that we don't really see any hippo, therefore it's difficult to see us, uh, to, to, for, for us to see them fighting. There could be a lot of fights going on uh, on Buffalo's Hook, the property to the north of us, where there is a lot more water, where I'm sure all of the hippos that would ordinarily be on Juma if it was a regular summer. So, um, yeah, I, I don't think we can assume that the hippos are not fighting simply because we are not seeing them. Even if we did have access to areas with more hippos, it may simply be just bad luck. We only spend six hours out of 24 every day on safari. So there are large chunks of things going on here that we are actually missing. <laughs> well, I'm very happy that Patrick has decided to place $10 on the hippo on the left. Patrick, I, I'm, I'm, I'm also backing the hippo on the left. Why? I'm not too sure. Maybe it's just because it looked bigger from the outset because it was standing a little bit more out of the water than the one of the, out on the right. Having said that though, it is the one on the right that kind of approached the one on the left. Therefore, not showing any signs of kind of giving into it. But then again, maybe that's because it was the one that ran off initially. Time will tell. I'm not planning on racing off just yet. Um, and I think it will be worth us investing some time here to see if we can't see any action between these two beasts. Because like I said, it can be quite a colossal affair when these animals get going with one another. James Taylor, you mentioned that if uh, the, the one out of the, the two here win, will the third hippo then step up for the challenge? And that's a very good question. I'm not sure if it is another male, it's possibly a female. Again, only time will tell. It'll be interesting to see though, certainly. You may be wondering what those massive clumps of twigs are in the trees, but I'll tell you when you come back, because you need to go off and see some animals that James has just found for you. Pigs, everybody, pigs. Wart pigs or warthogs, a particular favorite for many, many people. And I really enjoy them a great deal. I find them very character-filled, and, well, they're just stout, brave fellows, really. And what we have here is a sounder consisting of at least one sow. I'd say there were two sows here and her attendant offspring. Um, probably from December time, they look about a few months old. I think there's another sow behind the tree then. That cannot be all her babies, surely. Just go a little bit forward and see if there isn't another sow there. Otherwise, she has got a seriously impressive litter, especially if she's... No, there's the other sow. She's behind there. There we go. 
Mexico. And I suspect what you'll find is that they live in that termite mound quite close by there. We had an amazing experience last night with those lions that were trying to dig some, ter uh, some not some termites, dig some warthogs out of their termite mound burrow. It was fascinating to watch. They didn't get any in the end. And then, of course, the greatest specialist warthog killer that we know of in this area is Tingana. And Wayne, you want to know where he is? Nine-year-old male leopard, magnificent fellow that he is. I don't know where he is. The last we saw of him, he was mating with Tandi, uh, who is Karula's daughter and sister, just and Shadow's sister, of course on Juma itself, uh, way out of her territory, pretty much within his territory, on the border between his and Mbula's territories. We haven't found him since then. I think he went south with her across the southern border, and he's probably lurking around there sometime. We're kind of now in the border regions between his territory and the Anderson Mail's territory. We are in Tingana's territory, but the Anderson Mail has been seen forging this far east. Anyway, either of them would absolutely do us. Now, warthogs, as we've said before, are the most susceptible mammals to a drought at the moment because those tiny little legs, while explosively fast over a short distance, are no good for migrating. We're not far from the Arethusa Dam where we've just crossed over. And you know the water is almost finished in there. It's quite a disturbing thing to see. So those warthogs will still be going down there for a drink on a daily basis. And when that dries, uh, the next water closest to here I suppose, well, there is a pan on the airstrip, which isn't too far from here, so they might go there. Otherwise, they're going to have to start heading south, down towards Londolozi, or perhaps um, a little bit east even. Now, I saw a European bee eater fluttering through here. They don't really flutter, they more glide, I suppose. But we've lost sight of him. So this area too, if you look around, you can see it looks a bit different from much many of the others. And that's simply because it too burned two years ago. And it has not recovered because we haven't had much rain. That's not to say it's in bad health. Very angry rattling cysticulars. I'm just going to stop here. Brian, I'm going to ask you to try. I know it's going to be difficult. Underneath this bush here, on the far end there, is a chagra. It's hopping around on the ground there. Oh, there, can you see it? It's actually quite a nice view, if we can get him. Got him. That is fantastic. Well, we can see him hopping. Looked like a black crown chagra to me. There he goes. A brown-crowned chagra, or three-streaked chagra, used to be called. Beautiful gall. It goes... <whistles> he obviously didn't think that was a very good call. He's ignoring me completely. But the alarm calling you can hear is the rattling cysticular. And I'm just going to go back a little bit, because he's really upset. You can hear him shouting and shouting. And I wonder if this isn't a snake around here. Of course, this is what alerted Scott to the presence of the snake that he found. And we'll just see if there isn't some nasty reptile trying to get at one of the birds in the tree here. I don't see anything, I'm afraid. I don't see any black mamba. Right, we're staring straight into the sun. I think let's carry on. We're now heading to the southern reaches of Arethusa, and from whence we will go back towards Juma. See what we can find there, given that uh, Arethusa has not exactly delivered a great plethora of big game this afternoon. That is by no means a, um, by no means an insult to what is a very beautiful property here at Arethusa. Let's head back to Scott. He's still at the water at Sydney's Dam. It's always something going on there.
So, the hippo appeared to have, for now, resolved their dispute. And the good news is, is that the crocodile has been seen and there's an elephant that's just arrived behind us. It's no doubt going to walk straight past us when it does finally decide to continue towards the water. So that's something to look forward to. VM just went pssst. And there we go. So we're in for a treat and not a bad place to be waiting while these hippos may possibly start fighting again. More animals like elephant, who knows, buffalo, lion, leopard could all come and drink. This is a major water source in this general area. But let's zoom in and see if we can't see a glimpse of the crocodile. It's very, very difficult to see, although now I can't even see it. It must have gone into stealth mode. But it was just uh, to the right of that tiny little stump you can see in the water. So we'll keep an eye there. All you can see is a very faint outline of its head when it pokes its head out the water finally. Gail in Ohio, you would like to know uh, if that kind of line that we can see across on the dam wall about midway up is the usual water level. Um, yes, I guess it is. I mean, I've only spent one summer season here, uh, and even that summer season was a dry season, so it's been generally typically quite dry since my arrival here at Juma, drier than normal. Oh, so Mampala have also popped in onto the scene. So it appears like the water hole is becoming the place to be at the moment. The elephant's now to the right of the vehicle here. And all the action is coming to us. This is exactly how we like to safari, parked in the shade, waiting for everything to come to us. What a pleasure. This is a young boy. Could well be all on his own, or there could be a few more bulls on their way behind him. Fantastic. So, sorry, Gail, I can't give you huge insights into the kind of regular levels of this uh, water hole, but it usually just does rely on rainfall to fill itself up, and I guess it fluctuates greatly every year, just de depending on the actual rainfall that falls. I can assure you now, though, that it is much lower than normal, as are all the Juma water holes empty, which is abnormal. Ah, oh, Leanne, thank you very much for reminding me about the large clumps of twigs in those dead trees in the middle of the water and you would like to know if they are in fact birds nests well done that is entirely correct they are the nests of a sociable weaver called a red billed buffalo weaver now they don't appear hugely active to me at the moment oh no i lie the ones on the left vim uh, the, the tree on the far left further left of that yard. You can see a few birds fluttering around. There we go. So they are active, at least that apartment block of nests. And that essentially is what it is. It's an apartment block, each bird having their own chamber within that gigantic clump of twigs where they will nest. And what I'm going to do is obviously it's incredibly far away from here. So I shall find you the picture of them in the book in order to show you what these birds look like. They can be great indicators if you are lost in the wilderness. They will often build their nests on the western side of trees when possible. In this case, that doesn't make a huge difference because they're not being shaded by any living portions of the tree. But if there was a tree that did still have a lot of leaves that would block out the sun, they would nest on the western side. So if you're lost in the bush, in general, they will nest where the sun is going to be setting so that the chicks can go to bed warm at night. Good. 
I'm surprised that the elephant hasn't gone straight down to the water's edge like the impala. I'm just keeping an eye on it. It's somewhere over there. but I'm sure it will continue making its way in that direction, maybe even if it's a roundabout way. Cindy in North Carolina, um, you would like to know if hippos have got a kind of valve or a flap of skin in their throats that prevents them from choking when underwater, much like a crocodile has. And no, not that I'm aware of. They merely close their mouth as well as their nostrils when they go underwater. So I don't think they have that ability. But I cannot be certain. It's a good question. And if anybody knows or can confirm that I'm in fact wrong, Please feel free to correct me. The Impala finally found a spot that they think is safe to drink. It'll be hairy business for them, and I guess for good reason, now that we know that there is in fact a crocodile in here. The crocodile that I saw it wasn't tiny, that's for certain, and it has actually just popped its head back up to the right of that little stump. Let's see if you can make out. Yeah, you can. You will be able to make out a very slight, ever so slight cut of almost like a rock sticking out to the right of that stump. Look at all the fish rising in the water, bubbling. Miss Lynn. You would like to know how far the crocodile would have had to walk in order to get you. Um, it's, a, it's a good question. They can cover huge distances, though, in search of water. But, oh, can you see the crocodile? Now it's easier to see. It's swimming kind of in front of the log. You can definitely see some little bit of movement swimming towards us. Awesome. Maybe it's coming for these impala. It certainly looks like it's heading straight towards them, and maybe it's seen this as an opportunity to try and catch one. Imagine if we see a crocodile catching an impala live. That will be mind-boggling. And I've never actually seen a crocodile catch anything other than a terrapin once at Buffalo, Buffalo's Oak Waterhole, and that was between drives with Nikki. It chomped about three within five minutes. So, Lynn, um, crocodiles can move large distances out of water from one source to another. Where this one came from is hard to, to tell, um, but I'm guessing probably somewhere uh, close to the Sand River, which is about three or four kilometers from here. What have you spotted there, VM? No, I've got distracted by the giraffes. Oh, where are the giraffes? Okay. Uh, <laughs> Oh, look at those clouds. Awesome. And some giraffe have also arrived. This is the place to be. You can see, I think, three heads poking out. I'm sure they are going to continue out towards us. Um, but then, like I say, the Sand River is probably about four miles south of our position. So probably, yeah, it would have had to move it at about four miles, possibly a little bit more away from the river. And it would have been able to kind of leapfrog from one water source to another, to another, to another before getting here, I'm guessing. Um, of course, now, if this dries up, which it could, then the crocodile is going to have a long, long journey to move. But they have been on the planet for many millennia and are very hardy creatures. So I don't think we have to worry too much about it getting from A to B. I can't see where it's disappeared to. Oh, no, I can. It's just on the right hand side of further right VM, quite close to the bank. There we can see it. Slap bang in the center of your screen, basically 
between us and the two birds that you can see on that little peninsula. You can just see its head poking out ever so slightly out of the water. So it hasn't continued up to the impala, but they are animals of incredible stealth. So you need to be exceptionally aware of them. Looks like the giraffe have now come into a more favorable position for VM to film them. And quickly, VM, there's the one, a one-horned kudu just behind the back giraffe on the right. So let's bank that while we can. Hello. Where did we see a one-horned kudu? Was it with you, VM, the other day? Or was it with Brian? I think it was with Brian. I can't remember where it was. I'm fairly certain it was the same one. And look at that. Perfect afternoon sunlight. A beautiful female giraffe in her prime. She is in immaculate condition. Quite a nice dark coat, as is the one up ahead here. They've both got beautiful dark coats. And again, with this perfect afternoon sunlight bathing them. Oh, supermodels of the African wilderness, no doubt. Rock and Rolly, and I think Ronald, you guys requested to see giraffes. So there we go. Please let us know if there is anything else you'd like to see, and we'll just simply wait for a cheer. That seems to be the way things are unfolding for us this afternoon. And isn't it funny how the reason why we came here, which was for the hippopotamus, has now been upstaged. Well, not really upstaged, but thankfully substituted or supplemented by all these other animals that are coming in because the hippo have gone to sleep. Like a catwalk. Exactly. That giraffe, like VM says, is on the catwalk. And here we've got more visitors. Don't be alarmed. We are in the money here. This is a massive herd of impala. And who knows what is going to arrive next. You can VM, if you just pan a little bit more to the right, there's even another giraffe further back there, just on the other side of the road. We can see its head poking out below a dead tree, a little bit further right. There it is. It's still snacking before it heads to the bar for a drink, but it looks like it too now wants to join in on the fun. Look at how awesome those clouds are. Beautiful colors and a long, long stream of impala. Magical views. Randall in Illinois, are you interested to know if impala will associate with any other antelope in specific, like kudu. And no, uh, there's no set formula with regards to impala. They can rely on their own big numbers. Oh, we need to send you over to James quickly. Same yeah. one. The other two. We're just trying desperately, everybody, to get into a position to see what I think is one of the most fascinating birds that we get here, the secretary bird. Enormous snake-eating Raptorous thing. There are two of them. There's a pair. One has just disappeared behind the bush, and the other is sort of off in the distance there. There you can see it walking. It's an enormous bird. It probably stands about three and a half feet off the ground. And they go stamping around looking for snakes to eat. Hooked sort of raptor's bill, but they're not related to any of the other raptors as far as I'm aware. Isn't that amazing? And I know a lot of you have requested seeing a secretary bird. There they are. And there's the other one, Brian. I don't know if you can see this. This one is slightly closer to us. Just walking down through the dip there at 3 o'clock now. Not particularly confiding, this pair of them, but very nice to see anyway. Right behind that stick. You're right behind that stick, is it? Yeah. Absolutely astounding how our luck is. The universe has spat upon us this afternoon. There it goes. Uh, it's 
sort of see it, Brian. Anyway, wonderful to see them. I'll show you a picture, of course, in case you were slightly myopic and struggling to see the real thing. I think they're fantastic. And the most interesting thing for me, when you watch them trying to fly, of course, there they are, and I've yet to hear a satisfactory explanation for why they're called a secretary bird, but you can see that they've got those sort of feathers sticking from the back of their heads, and apparently those are like the pens that a secretary might put in her hair. I think that's ridiculous myself. And then apparently also perhaps the knickerbocker-like feathers on the legs, which apparently a uh, secretary might also wear. I've never had a secretary, of course. I've never um, met a secretary that wears either pins in her head or knickerbockers like that, so I'm not sure why it really called a secretary bird. Brian, any idea? Mm. Now, as we drive along here, what is interesting is that they like open areas, and they are big, heavy birds. They probably weigh in excess of eight kilograms or so, and that, if you multiply it by 2.2, gets you to about 18 pounds. That's heavy for a bird out here. And to take off, they must almost turn into the wind, and if, they are, if, the, if there's a strong wind behind them, they'll really struggle to take off. They need to turn into the wind, just like an aeroplane, open their wings, and then off this kind of float. And I was reading about bird flight the other day. A fascinating, fascinating explanation. Oh, this thing keeps coming out. I'm so sorry. Hang on a second. There we go. We're back in now. Um, just some starlings there, Brian. Looks like one of them had a feather. Yeah, it does have a feather. Is that a feather? What is that? Is that a feather or a moth? I think it's a moth. I can't tell what that is at this distance. I think it might be a feather. And Lewis Lyon, while we were trying to figure out what on earth that starling is doing, you want to know how many words per minute it is a feather, how many words per minute a uh, secretary bird can type. Lewis, uh, the good one's around 60, and the really impressive one's around 90, and the particularly gormless ones, about 20. I don't know what it's doing with that feather. It doesn't look like a sort of nest tree. That's really interesting. I don't know what it would be doing, and I wonder if it doesn't actually come from that secretary bird. It's a huge white feather. It definitely doesn't come from the starling. What a catch. What a catch. Now, these are one of two starling species, of course. Either the greater blue-eared glossy starling or the cape glossy starling. And the only way at this distance to tell is from the call. The greater blue-eared will go... And the, greater, and the cape glossy will go... Cape glossy starling. Cape glossy starling. I'm not actually joking. That is genuinely how you tell the difference. Now, I can hear a woodpecker, Brian. Can you hear it pecking? Where well, do you suppose it is? Peck, peck, peck. I think, oh, there it is. I can see it. Have you got it? Genius, man. You're a genius. That's the most common woodpecker species we get here. And that is the cardinal woodpecker. That is a female cardinal woodpecker. As far as I can tell. Yes. I will show you how I know it is Mrs. Cardinal Woodpecker. Although, of course, being a cardinal precludes having a Mrs. most of the time. Let me find her for you. Yes. Oh, that's a lovely view of her. See, no red head there. No red head. Her husband would have a red head like a cardinal's cap, and that's why he's called Cardinal Woodpecker. And she doesn't have one. What a lovely sound of the bush, that tap, 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 
tap, tap, tap, tap, tap, which you only hear if you're very quiet. Tap, tap, tap. And she's drilling, of course, below the surface of the bark for insects and larvae, insect larvae that might be there. They're remarkable, really, the adaptations that a woodpecker has to be able to slam its head against solid objects all day long and not become concussed are really quite impressive. Amazing brain case filled with like a spongy substance that absorbs the shock. You can see her tail there. You see the way her tail is, is sort of pushing against the branch? It's acting as a kind of, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's, it's basically stabilizing her. The tail is much harder than it is on many birds, so she's able to sort of stabilize that incredible pecking motion that she's doing now with a hard tail. And then she has a very long tongue that probes into the little holes that she's drilled. Very clever. That is the smallest woodpecker species we get here and also seems to be the most common. The other ones? All on this page of the book, actually. The cardinal, that's them there, and that's the male there with his red hat. You can see? Uh, and the common one also down here is the bearded woodpecker. We get that one quite often in the morning going... Now, before I get too ridiculous, there are some giraffe having a drink. Let's head across to Scott. Well, epic, epic work by Mr. James to find the secretary birds. I don't think I've ever, maybe I've got one on camera once in over a year of being here. And thankfully you didn't miss out on anything. Uh, no crocodile consumed any impala. It moved though away from where it was. So it's not on that same bank where the giraffe is. It's moved across to the opposite side of the waterhole. And the giraffe have been very, very cautious, which is interesting because they're so much bigger than the impala and essentially have, I guess, slightly less to worry about, but maybe their bird's eye view is making it easier for them to see that crocodile, which is installing fear into them. But we may just get lucky and see the first one start to drink now. It's an incredible, thing to see because they have to really splay those front legs wide open in order to get their neck low enough down to the water's edge and something to look out for and something to try and capture with some screenshots I mean I know we're far away is their little head flick once they finish drinking they do this really cool flick of their head which sends a spray of water into the air so keep an eye out for that and maybe try and fire away some screenshots here we go. Look at that. Oh, the one got a fright there. No, that wasn't the regular kind of head flick I was hoping for. I think the one giraffe spooked when it saw the further one move off quite hurriedly. <laughs> Jimelin in Oklahoma, you've just said it is starting to look something like a scene from Noah's Ark here. And you're right, there's so far been a array of different animals. I mean, we can count crocodile, hippopotamus, giraffe, impala, kudu, elephant. So six different species, or at least five mammals, one reptile all in the same spot and who knows what will pop up next vm has just said we need tingana to walk over that dam wall down for a drink and then continue straight south towards us and into juma where we'll see him actually i forgot to mention that vm said he was gonna antagonize the crocodile for a little bit slap it around and then continue south onto juma where it would catch an impala for us so that's vm's predictions and wishes for Tingana, who is a big male leopard to come onto the scene. While we wait for the giraffe to pluck up some courage though, there's 
two hornbills just over to our right here that are having a little snack that might be worth taking a look at. They such go, they just flew off as VM started going for it, so we will cancel that plan. But they're such comical birds that I really like to try and show you guys whenever we get the opportunity to. But as so often happens with the birds, they do not hang around. And as we try and get them on camera, they flutter off. Speaking of birds, you can see some waddling in between the giraffe there. Those are a family of Egyptian gooses, or geese rather. It's mongooses, not geese, uh, goose, uh, geeses, gooses. Again, I didn't get enough sleep today due to some first aid training that we're doing. Oh, no, that wasn't the sufficient head flick that I was hoping for. We did some really cool first aid training where we did a real life kind of scenario. I was the patient, so I had a broken leg and the first aid train had come with all kinds of strange plastic kind of training aids that simulated me having a broken leg. He had a whole bunch of fake blood that he smeared all over me and we did a simulation of me having fallen out of a tree in the middle of the bush when everyone came onto the scene to practice emergency protocols. So that's my excuse for not making any sense this afternoon. <laughs> but it was really good training and it's important that we do keep our first aid up to scratch out here. Obviously we don't have any ambulances around the corner and even though there is a first aid medic in the Sabi Sands that caters for the whole Sabi Sands, he's 45 minutes away from us so we need to certainly be ready for any emergencies if need be. So that's what we are up to during the course of the day. I think Kirsty may have a photo or two that she could maybe Hashtag Safari Live onto Twitter. Oh, I'm told she sent it to me already. She's one step ahead, so I'll be able to show you guys. That's going to be easier, but I'm going to have to, I think, do that a little bit later on. So that's a little treat for later. I can't turn my phone on now because, oh, there's the flick. Look at how far the water went. Can you believe that? I mean, if a giraffe's on average about four meters tall, that went, I'd say, five or six meters out into the water. Let's see if we get another good flick here. Get ready for the screenshots. And ready. Steady, go. Oh, one of the most awesome things to see. Giraffes drinking. Oh, Kirsty only gave it a seven out of 10. I would have given that up, upwards of an eight, prob probably a nine, but Kirsty's, whew, you see now that, that was a, th you know, that was a, well, Kirsty thought that one was better. We're obviously rating different things here. Kirsty obviously got a kick out of the fact that the giraffe was terrified there, but it was not nearly as far as the first two, Kirsty. <laughs> I don't know what's bothering the giraffe on the legs, whether it's flies. I mean, you can see they're wagging their tails profusely but they're also kind of stamping their feet down. And I think that could be to try and rid themselves of the flies. There's also a third giraffe further off to their right, quite a lot paler than the two on the left, which is interesting to note. And it too, it's really stamping its legs down. Let's keep an eye on it for a second and see if it doesn't give us another leg stomp. It seems to be doing it more readily than the other two. Come on, don't let me down. Come on. Well, you certainly can see its fly swatting tail is hard at work though. Uh, no luck. Anyway, I guess it wasn't a great spectacle to see, but there is obviously something giving them a hard time. I'm guessing it's the flies. Hence the funny leg stomps from now from time to time naturally while we were on that one the other one down by the water's edge started doing it 
Heather, you say how it's incredibly neat how the giraffe have the ability to prevent the blood rushing down from uh, their body down into their head while they're drinking like that uh, to prevent them fainting. And they do have an incredibly complex system of valves in their arteries and veins which control the blood flow to their brain. They've also got something called a blood sponge, which is kind of an intense network of arteries at the base of the skull which diffuse one larger artery which carries most of that blood up to the brain at very high pressures and when it gets to uh, kind of the base of the brain it then diffuses into a whole bunch of smaller arteries therefore lowering that intense pressure not causing their head to explode but you're right and thank you for pointing that out it is important to know that their anatomy is specifically and specially evolved and adapted to be able to get their blood all the way up into that their head of theirs and it does require some very unique valve systems which most of the animals do not possess oh i thought i'd seen another animal coming down but it was just the third giraffe wagging its tail in the bush Hello to Enid in Connecticut. You would like to know if that leg stomping is not something to do with kind of fights or flight uh, response. And no, I don't think so. Um, if a giraffe is scared of anything, uh, it will usually not really confront it. Although sometimes giraffes will stand their ground to line if they are in thick bush and use those long legs to stomp out at them. But that's not what we're seeing here. Um, because there's no lions around so or anything really that's giving them a hard time so that's why i think it's the flies that they're just trying to keep it bad it's almost out of frustration you could say that they're stomping down with their legs not that it makes huge sense to just a gentle leg wobble would probably do the trick to swish the flies away but yes yeah, certainly if they are under attack from lions they will use those long powerful legs of them to try and keep them at bay